I always say that going to the moon is like being led into the rare book room of the Cosmic Library. Author Andrew Chaikin has interviewed 23 of the 24 Apollo astronauts and all 12 who set foot on the lunar surface. In every single case, these were people who were absolutely motivated to be the best there was. Chaikin's new book, Voices of the Moon, is culled from those interviews and restored pictures, like this rare image of Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. If there's one common thread, I would say, for the moonwalkers, it's the fact that they really didn't have a lot of time while they were on the moon to stop and take in the experience. They were so overcommitted, their timelines were so full, that it really was in kind of stolen moments that they were able to look around and absorb the awesome reality of being on another world. The Apollo astronauts' time on the moon was mostly committed to scientific experiments, running tests, gathering rocks. After Apollo 11 achieved the first moon landing in July 1969, there were five more by the end of 1972. Those six landings, we barely scratched the surface of what the moon has to tell us. The later missions let astronauts spend much more time on the lunar surface than the two hours for Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. The last pair had 22 hours walking. For all, it was an impossible dream come true. Seeing the Earth shrink to the size of your outstretched thumb is going to kind of put things in perspective about how you see the, the pluses and minuses of daily life. At the end of a decade of civil rights unrest, anti-Vietnam War protests, and political assassinations, the moon landing was a great unifying moment. It was kind of a healing agent for the country to say that whatever is that old-fashioned American can-do value, the can-doism of George Washington at Valley Forge, or the can-doism of the Union Army at Antietam, whatever the case might be, uh, we still had it. Landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. President Kennedy had set in motion what became a $25 billion space program, about $125 billion in today's dollars. The Apollo program was part of the Cold War, and it was a, a, it, we put real um, resources, tax dollars, into the program. We didn't go to the moon for the sake of exploration. We didn't do it for a love of science or a love of discovery. We went to the moon to beat the Russians. Kennedy wanted to show the world the strength of a free society and score a crucial victory in the Cold War. It was a race with the Russians, our Cold War rivals. And Apollo 11 showed we won the race. And so how do you sustain interest in a, in a program that was set up from the start to beat the Russians to the moon after you beat the Russians to the moon? But today, NASA is trying to revive interest in returning manned space flights to the moon. There's no question NASA can get back to the moon with astronauts by 2020. They have the technology. Uh, they have the know-how. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The real question comes down to, is there the national will there to spend the money required to do it? We went to the moon, we took something that seemed like science fiction and we made it a reality. The other thing that I consider Apollo's greatest legacy is the view of the Earth from the moon as a very finite, very precious oasis of life in the void. And that is a lesson that we are still absorbing, that we still need to absorb of our planet as a world to be cherished and protected.